So good morning. Um, last time, as I was concluding the lecture, I told you that um, the a, 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 something that we are interested in would be to figure out how uh, so-called line, surface, and volume elements deform. So in this lecture, we're going to develop the description of that deformation. Um, and in particular, we are interested in very small differential or infinitesimal elements. And uh, for this purpose, let's again recall our generic setting where we have a reference configuration, R0. And uh, this configuration will eventually be mapped to a current configuration, R. And we are interested in what happens at a certain point, and that point is capital X, and this point will be sent through the motion map, chi of T of capital X, um, to the current position of the point, let's say small x. Okay. Um, so now, that's my point, and let's imagine that before my body deforms, uh, on the body, I take a pencil, inside somehow I can put a mark, or on a surface I could do it the same. Uh, let's imagine that somewhere in the body, perhaps in the volume, I could put a line, okay? And this line is a blue line. And let's say it goes like this. And the line has a length L, okay? And in order to measure the distance I move along the line from one end to the other end, I'm going to introduce a coordinate. I'm going to call this coordinate capital S, okay? So capital S eventually will be called the arc length parametrization. Now, eventually, I'll do something similar on the, on the current configuration. I'm going to use the coordinate small s. So why is it called the arc length? Because this is not a straight line. It's a curved line. It's an arc. And s tells me how much I move physically in terms of a given distance along that line. So I'm here. So if, I'm, if I move along by a distance s, so that the value of s is the absolute length of the line up to that point. So if I move all the way, the length is L. So after all the points on that line get mapped onto the current configuration, of course, this line is going to look different. And perhaps it's going to look like this. And what's going to happen, of course, is the length of the line is also going to change. Now it's going to be, let's say, small L. And to distinguish between the two parametrizations, I'm going to measure my position along the um, deformed blue line with small s. Okay, so that would be the arc length on the deformed configuration. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce a vector that is tangent to this blue line okay, at point x. Now, I could draw a vector of any magnitude that is tangent to the blue line. But the way I'm going to imagine this vector is that it will be a tiny vector that points in the direction of this line as it passes through the black point and of an infinitesimal length. Okay? So it's like a tiny chunk from the blue line. And the direction indicates the direction along which the line is running. So for that reason, I'm going to indicate that vector with a differential symbol. That's going to be d capital X. Now, since all the blue points get mapped onto the current configuration, and now I get a deformed blue line, if I map every tiny point that is associated in the vicinity, that is associated with this small uh, with the capital X point. In other words, all the points that lie in the vicinity of that point. I can, in a sense, take the same vector and find out how it deforms and rotates, right? So this line as a whole, it changes its orientation and it changes its length. 
So if you like, this vector constitutes of many points that lie very, very close to each other in the vicinity of capital X. So since I'm zooming so much, what I see is just a straight line. So these are just a set of points, if you like. And after deformation, the line is changing its length and is changing its orientation. So this vector as well will change its orientation and it will change its length. Okay. Um, so uh, another way to express that association with the material points is to think of or assign this vector, d capital X, its magnitude. And this magnitude is going to be an incremental distance along the undeformed configuration. So incremental arc length. And likewise, I can do the same here. I can introduce the incremental arc length, which is going to be nothing bad but the uh, magnitude of that vector. Okay? So this dx is tangent to the material line at x. And likewise, d cap d small x is tangent to the material line at small x. Now notice that I'm calling this a material line. Last time I gave an example with a fly flying through a set of sensors. There could be a sensor on the fly. The sensors could be fixed on the surface, or their sensors could move independently of the motion of the fly. The fly, in this case, represents a material point. So when we say that this line is a material line, we mean that this blue line is attached to the particles. So in other words, when the particles deform, the blue line moves exactly with those particles, and hence the name material line. We could imagine a hypothetical scenario where there is a line that somehow moves and deforms independently from the motion of the particles. But no, that's not the case. Every point on this particle, on this blue line, gets mapped onto this one through the motion function, and hence the name material line. Now, likewise, what I could do is, so that is a line, and this is a, if you like, an infinitesimal line element. This is a finite line. But that one is an infinitesimal line element with some infinitesimal length. Uh, similarly, I could draw a surface element. So on the surface of the object, I'm going to draw, I'm going to take a patch. Now, this patch, in principle, could be of any size. But I'm going to, again, imagine that it has a very small size. And I characterize the surface uh, patch, this infinitesimal material um, surface element with its size, area, and with its orientation. And this orientation is naturally according to the outward unit normal um, of the ref on the reference configuration. So all those green points are going to be mapped onto the current configuration. And of course, this area will deform in a certain way, and its size will change. And not only that, the orientation will also change. And now the orientation is the normal to the current configuration. And finally, I could have a material volume element, infinitesimal size. And somewhere in the volume, I take a prism, let's say, rectangular prism, a tiny one of volume d, small d capital V. And all those red points are going to be mapped according to the motion function, and I'm going to get a new prism. And that new volume element is going to have a volume d small v. So that's the picture. And the question that we would like to answer now is the following. We are interested in finding out how these Um, material line, surface, and volume elements are related to one another. In other words, we're trying to answer what is the relationship between d capital X and d small x, d capital A and d small a, and finally d capital V and d small v. So, so the goal is given the motion 
and a infinitesimal line surface or volume element, can I immediately determine the magnitude and orientation of the deformed line element, surface element, and the volume element? Okay, that's my goal. So given these and the motion, I'd like to find out what these are, the relation between the two. So this is what I'm seeking, this link. And we are going to go in this natural order because step by step, this helps us determine that, that helps us determine that in some sense. So we'll start with the material line elements. Do you have any question about this picture we have up here? OK. Just, yeah, right, go ahead. Why is the area is not We'll come to that. So why is the area not a vector? OK, I will make it a vector soon. Currently, I have just the magnitude. And of course, there is a natural orientation. And we will eventually embed that into our uh, formulation. We will do it. OK, so the material line elements. So we are interested in finding out the relation between the capital X and the small x. And uh, it's actually quite uh, elegant and simple once you think about the motion function. So the infinitesimal line element on the reference configuration is just any vector. So it has a magnitude, and I already told you that the magnitude is d capital N S, and therefore remains, there remains the uh, direction, and I will call it capital M. So capital M is just a unit vector in the direction of d capital X. Uh, now, as soon as you look at this relation, what I could also do is I could take the partial derivative of, or I could take the ratio dx over ds, and that would give me m. Uh, but instead, what I'm going to do is you could take the derivative of capital X with respect to several things, perhaps. I'm going to take a partial derivative with respect to x, just for uh, a complete notation. And the outcome is a unit vector, which is a vector that points in the direction of d capital X. Now, I put, it in, I put it in two different ways, but the result on the right hand side is actually a result that is, even if you didn't write this, it will be a result that is induced by the definition of what, for what s, um, it's, the, it, it's a result that is induced by what, um, by the fact that s is a, arc length parametrization, I could not somehow formulate the uh, sentence. OK, so if you have a line, and that line is parametrized by an arc length, and if you're at a certain point, and you have a position capital X, and this position capital X is now parametrized by S, right? So X of S equals 0 is there, right? So for every value of S, it gives me an absolute position along the line, right? So when S is equal 0, I'm here. And when it's S is equals L, I'm there. So you can think that capital X, the position, is parametrized for this line by the value of S. So when I take the partial derivative of this position, so the position has a coordinate somewhere there, there, it could be here, it could be there, depending on the value of X. So when I take the derivative of this position vector with respect to S, by the fact that this is an arc length parametrization, one. I will get, in any case, a vector that is tangent to this blue line. But two, because this is an arc length parametrization, it will be a unit vector. Okay? So by the definition of arc length. Um, OK. So similarly, on the deformed configuration, I have the Vector d small x, magnitude ds, and direction m. Or partial x with respect to s will give me the um, arc, will give me the unit vector m. Okay. 
Um, so now, let me take this one. So both are results that we've just written down for reference. Let me start with the deformed configuration. And yes, I can parameterize on the deformed point configuration along the blue line x with a function, with a, with a parameter s. Uh, but after all, x is determined through the motion, and that motion is a function of capital X and also time. So what I could do is I could instead take a derivative with respect to first capital X, and then with respect to small x, small s. But wait, let me not do that. Instead, why don't I first take a derivative with respect to capital S and then capital S with respect to small s? Okay, so I've done a bunch of chain rules here. Okay. So now here appears a bunch of quantities, and some of them we have already defined. This one we have not yet defined. It's the partial derivative of the map, motion map, or position on the current configuration with respect to the referential position. It's a vector with respect to a vector. So that's a tensor. And now that tensor is going to be called F. Um, and that's what it's called pretty much everywhere. Okay? Now it's in red because it's an important tensor, obviously. This one here is capital M. We've already observed it up there. And therefore, what we have is a relation that says small m is equal to F capital M um, D capital S DS. Okay. Or, or what I can do is, if you like, I can multiply both sides with ds. And that is going to give me d capital X on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, I will have f d capital S m left. And this here is nothing but dx. So from here, we also see that F is the tensor that takes a material line element on the reference configuration and maps it to the current configuration. So essentially, we've already answered the first of our questions. If I know what the motion is, then I can calculate the tensor F. All I need to do is I take a partial of small x with respect to capital X. You give me any material line element with any direction, I will be able to map it to the current configuration and find the new length and the orientation implicitly. Right? Um, so this tensor F is called the and rightly so, you're taking the gradient of the motion map or the deformation map. It's called the deformation gradient tensor. That's F, which is partial X over partial capital X. Now, we can go ahead and write it in components, right? So it is going to be partial xi over partial xa. And now you attach the bases. It's going to be ei bon um, ea. Okay. And these here are the components fia. And of course, the value of the motion map Right? This, this, is the, this has to do with the motion. The value of small x depends on which particle you are tracking. So it depends on capital X and depends on which time you are monitoring that particle at. Right? So this depends on capital X and time. And therefore, when you take a gradient with respect to capital X, what results still will depend on capital X and time in general. So it will have the Lagrangian representation capital XT, but it will also have, if you like, and if you want to do it that way, 
you can also have the earlier unit representation, small xt. In any case, it depends on position and time. Right, so if we think about the um, current configuration, okay, so we have a tensorial function now. That tensorial function is F tilde. And at any given point, at any given time, it has a certain value. At a different point, or at the same point at a different time, it will have a different value. Or if you want to think in terms of the Lagrangian function at any given position for any given particle, for a given time, it has a value. For a different particle, it has a different value, et cetera. Right? So that's the Lagrangian and the Eulerian. So there is a tensorial field. So in other words, f over the configuration is not a constant. Let's immediately admit that. Right? Just like the motion map is highly dependent on where you are and what the time is. So now, by the way, as you see, this is yet another encounter. And now with an object that is very, very important for us. Uh, another encounter with a tensor that has sort of one leg in the reference configuration and one leg in the current configuration. And those tensors, let's now give them a name, are called two-point tensors. And it's natural, for instance, that this tensor um, is such a two-point tensor because its job, its task, is to take a vector that lives on the reference configuration and map it to a vector that lives on the current configuration. Right? So for it to be able to do that, it has to communicate, if you like, with both configurations. And that's why its basis naturally admits uh, the basis vectors from um, both configurations. Okay. Um, now, um, as soon as we talk about, by the way, the magnitudes of these lines, of course, just like how the orientations will change in general, the magnitudes will also change in general. And when we think of something that changes its length, mechanically, we often characterize that with the concept of strain. So indeed, the concept of strain is going to be very directly associated with these values, d small and capital X. And we're going to come back to that after we're done with this discussion of um, material elements. Okay? So the concept of strain will follow these, um, the absolute changes in the length of the material line elements. Before now, I move on to the surface element. Any question? No. All right. So let's do the area element. Now, the line element actually does most of the job for us. Once we figure out how the material line elements are mapped, the rest is actually pretty uh, straightforward. So let's look at the green one. material surface elements. And so in this case, we are interested in how d capital A is mapped into d small a. Um, and I want to construct a material surface element of infinitesimal size. And a simple way to do that is to take or define that area by two infinitesimal material line elements. Let's call them d, d capital X1 and d capital X2. They don't have to be perpendicular to each other. But due to the fact that I have two of them, I define a parallelogram. Okay? And now what I'd like to do is I'd like to calculate the uh, area of this infinitesimal area element. Okay? So that's going to be d capital A. And of course, there is a no natural normal associated with this area. And that would be capital N. And capital N, as you will immediately recognize, is just 
well, first of all, it's in the direction of the cross product between these two material line elements. So it's going to be d capital X1 cross d capital X2, but it has to be a unit of normal. So I can always normalize it. So after deformation, these two material line elements will get mapped into two different line elements, d small x1 and d small x2. And now here I have a new parallelogram. And this is of size d small a. And there is a new normal associated with them. Still, this normal is in the direction of the cross product between dx1 and dx2, but it's a unit normal. Okay, so that's what I have. Okay. Um, right. Now, if I take the cross product between these two vectors, what comes in is the magnitude of the two vectors and the sine of the angle between them. Okay? So in other words, the cross product magnitude naturally contains the information about the area. So the area, dA, is nothing but the magnitude of d capital X1 cross d capital X2. Right? In fact, there is also the area information. Let's embed that. All right, let's first write it like this. And then, so that's the magnitude of the, that's the area. Um, I will also build the area vector. And that vector is going to be composed of the magnitude of the area and the direction of the area, n. Okay? So that is nothing but d capital X1 cross d capital um, X2. And that information we have up here as well. And dA is dx1 cross dx2. So here we have um, the sign coming in and hence delivering us information about the magnitude of the area. Now, the same thing I could do on the deformed configuration, right? So I, have, I can build a vector, d small a, which is the magnitude of the vector times the direction, and which is going to be nothing but d small x1, d small x2. Now, once I write both of these, and just have a look here for a second, we are done. Okay. So what I like to find out is the relation between dA and d capital A, or perhaps even more information about the relation between the normals, etc. And now I have two formulations in terms of material line elements on reference and current configuration. But now I've just found out the relation between material line elements on reference and current configuration. So I know that this is equal to f dx1. And I know that the second one is f d capital X2. Okay? So now, if I'd like to somehow suppose, I suppose I was able to take the f outside of the cross product, so that I would have here dx1 cross d capital X2, then I would have immediately this object appearing here, and hence that would enable me to observe a direct relation between d capital X cross d capital X cross, cross d capital X2 and this one. Okay? And indeed, I have such a relation that comes from the definition of f sharp. So F sharp is such that it allows me to take the tensor out of the cross product. And now I have ended up with a relation that tells me the exact map from a material surface element on the reference configuration to the surface element on the deformed configuration. And this is called nonsense formula.
So the cofactor tensor F sharp allows us to make this or realize this map. But remember, uh, so it is transpose of the inverse. So I, or I can calculate this from the inverse. So, so the major thing that lies in, the deform in, in this quantity is the deformation gradient tensor again. Once I know what the deformation gradient tensor is, then I can immediately calculate F sharp. And what underlies the deformation gradient tensor is the motion map. So once I know the motion, I can calculate all of these maps immediately. Okay, so now you, you can take a step forward as well. And uh, if you are really interested in actually the relation between the magnitude of the areas, what you can do is, for instance, you can dot both sides with itself. So for instance, left-hand side, I can dot with DAN. And the right-hand side is equal to this quantity, but so I'm going to dot it instead of with DAN directly with itself. So I'll dot both sides with, the, with itself. I will get two scalars that are still going to satisfy the equality. And I will obtain, so on the left-hand side, that's a unit vector, n dot n is 1, so I will have dA squared is equal to f sharp n dot f sharp n dA capital A squared. Um, it's nice to take this tensor and put it to the right hand side, of course there comes in a transpose, so I will have n dot f sharp transpose f sharp and dA squared. Okay, or you can take now the square root of both sides and in the square root you will have this quantity. Now, soon when we talk about um, the concept of strain, we are going to look at the ratio of the magnitude of material line elements, d small s over d capital S, and we're going to call that the stretch. In this case, this is not a quantity that, we will, that will appear again during our lectures, but the ratio of d small a to d capital A, it's a quantity that I can calculate at any given point along any direction, okay? And that is called, if you like, the aerial stretch. It tells me how much the magnitude of the area is changing. How did I eliminate the small n? I dotted both sides with itself. So here I would have dA n dot dA n. n dot n, it's 1 because it's a unit vector. Yeah. OK. So now where am I? 
I like to map material line area and volume elements or line surface and volume elements to one another. And the underlying information comes from the motion map. And we just found out that once you know the motion map, you can take its gradient with respect to capital X at any given point, at any given time. That gives me a tensor F. And that tensor F is responsible for this map. You calculate the cofactor tensor, JF minus transpose, or F sharp. And that tensor is responsible for the aerial map. And now, what's left is the volume map. And of course, you can imagine the same tensor is somehow going to be responsible for that map as well. So let's have a look at that one. So material volume elements. So I like to construct a volume, right? And I'm again just like I did for the area, because it's going to be an infinitesimal volume, I'd like to take a differential volume that can be constructed through some line elements, d capital X1, d capital X2, and another one that is just like these two are not necessarily perpendicular to each other. The third one that I choose doesn't need to be perpendicular to these either. So it's just any dx3. And together, these. define a parallelogram okay. or a rectangular prism. So now, after the motion, um, this prism is going to deform because each line element is going to be mapped to a new line element. Let's say that's how it looks on the deformed configuration. And this is a volume D capital V. This is a volume D small v. And my goal is to relate those two incremental volumes. So how do I calculate the volume? I have the base area times the cosine of the angle between the normal to that area and the magnitude of that vector. Okay? So that information will naturally come through if I dot dx3 with the cross product of dx1 and dx2. Okay. So that is d capital V. Now, this is a triple product of dx3, dx1, and dx2. And remember, this obeys the permutation rule. So here, if you like, by the way, here comes the information about the cosine between the normal and the direction of that vector, because they don't need to be perpendicular to one another. Um, they don't need to be in the same direction, right? This is not perpendicular to the area. Okay, so now this obeys the permutation rule. So this is already an ordered triple, so this is actually equal to, if you want, you can put it into the nice order dx1, dx2, dx3. So two permutations, one, and yet another permutation, two. 
So it's the same value. So the triple product of dx123 gives me the magnitude of the volume on the, ref on the reference configuration. Likewise, by the same argument, I have eventually that the volume on the deformed configuration is the triple product of the infinitesimal line elements on the spatial configuration. Now, and my goal is to somehow relate the two, but now, again, I realize that each of these line elements are actually mapped to one another directly through the deformation gradient tensor. And not only that, I conveniently now realize that this is almost, right, so first of all, dx1, dx2, dx3 are linearly independent vectors. And hence, they constitute a basis, OK? Uh, they are not unit vectors, but nevertheless, it's a basis. But so remember, in the definition of the invariance, I took any three vectors. They didn't need to be uh, unit. They didn't need to be orthogonal. And hence, now I immediately see, well, let's do that. I take the ratio of d small v to d capital V. And that is equal to triple product f d capital X1, FD capital X2, FD capital X3, divided by triple product DX1, DX2, and DX3. Any three vectors that are linearly independent. And that is equal to determinant of F, which we are now going to call J. So J equals determinant of F, which is the ratio of D small v to capital V, is what we will call the Jacobian of either mapping or deformation. Both names are equally valid. <coughs> and just like the um, deformation gradient tensor itself, this is, of course, a function that admits either a Lagrangian or an Eulerian um, representation. So here you also see that for us to be able to talk about physical deformations, j needs to be greater than 0. Because if it is less than 0, it means at some point it needs to go through 0 as well. And that means that you have a finite volume shrinking to a point. So physically, that's not going to happen. So this is always greater than 0. Mathematically, you can easily construct a map between two configurations. You can have a non-physical configuration, okay, um, such that, let's say, a mirror image or whatever, um, such that when you do a map from one configuration to another, you have a function, a tensorial function, the determinant of which is negative. But physically, I always think about an object. This object is going to move and deform. And as it does so, it initially starts up with some physical finite volume. And that volume is always going to remain physical and finite. Okay? Physical meaning positive and, and non-zero as well. Um, OK. Um, so now let me dwell on this a little bit more. So I have the Jacobian. Now it turns out that when we eventually talk about balance laws, something that I like to do is I'd like to be able to take the time rate of change of j with respect to time, or the material time derivative, really. And so let's go ahead and try to calculate the material time derivative. And I'll do that perhaps on this board over here. What is the material time derivative of j? 
And uh, why don't you look here for a second? Let's walk through this together. Now here, of course, uh, what's going to help us is a result from homework number two that you have already shown, um, the Jacobi's formula, which says that if I have a tensorial function A of some variable among others of tau, uh, and I'd like to take the derivative with respect to tau of the determinant of this function, A, tensorial function, then the result is determinant of A times trace of dA d tau A inverse. Okay? That's Jacobi's formula. So presently, d d tau is like d d t or dot. So this would be determinant of A dot, A dot, etc. Okay? And the tensor that I have presently is nothing but F. And therefore, so J dot is going to be equal to determinant of f, j, trace of f dot, f inverse. So in principle, that is the result, but we can actually, it turns out, simplify it considerably more. So for that purpose, let's have a look at what f dot is. f dot is equal to ddt del x over del capital X. That's the therefore definition of the deformation gradient. So now I'm trying to take the material time derivative of this quantity. But what lies underneath here does not depend on time. So I can easily take this time derivative and move it on top of small x. And the material time derivative of small x is nothing but the velocity. So this is equal to del v over del capital X. Now I'm going to do a, uh, again, a chain rule. Well. Just like I can take the derivative of V with respect to capital X using its Lagrangian representation, I can always switch to an Eulerian representation and first take a derivative with respect to small x, and then of small x with respect to capital X. Okay? Because at any given time, given x, I can find out what small x is. So that's what I've done. So now I have f dot equals. This is the gradient of the velocity on the deformed configuration, which we call the velocity gradient tensor capital L. And this is equal to F. Okay? So what I found out is that F dot is equal to actually LF. Right? So now, um, or alternatively, I have found out that F dot F inverse is equal to L, which is a quantity that conveniently appears there. So I'm going to take L and plug it in there. So I have trace of L equals, um, right, LII. That's the sum of the diagonal components. L is del V over del X, so it's VI comma I. So the trace of the velocity gradient tensor is LII, which is VI comma I, which is, what's this quantity? Divergence of the velocity vector. Okay. So therefore, J dot is equal to J divergence of and that's the result that we found out, and it's going to be immensely useful. Let me just also note that, that note an alternative representation. Or, um, sometimes it's needed. So trace of L is trace of L can be decomposed into its symmetric and skew symmetric part. Symmetric one was called D. The skew symmetric part we called W. By that definition, skew symmetric part is traceless, so this is equal to trace of D. So this is also equal to J trace of D, just to keep in mind. Okay. All right, good. All right. Why don't you please write that much?
Okay, so now immediately from this relation, we notice something particular in the case when divergence of V vanishes. In that case, when this is zero, J dot is equal to zero, which means the volume is not changing. In other words, the object is not necessarily stationary. It's just, it's moving in such a way that divergence of V is zero, and therefore, if this is true at every point, let's say, in the domain of the object, uh, then the overall volume of the object is also not changing. Not only point-wise, because j, it's a function of position and time. So if divergence of v is equal to 0, at every point, the value of j is not changing. Now, this could happen during, and therefore the volume is not changing overall either. So this could be happening only through some window in time. So for t in between two special values, let, values, let's say t1 and t2. And if this happens, so in other words, during some time window, divergence of v vanishes such that j doesn't change, then one calls such a motion isochoric. Um, so isochoric meaning volume preserving. Now note that up to time t1 and beyond t2, the value of j could change because perhaps outside of this time window, divergence of v does not vanish. Only during this time it vanishes. So in other words, the fact that the motion is isochoric may have got nothing to do with the object you're trying to um, analyze. Now, on the other hand, some objects are such that the material structure constituents are such that they resist this volume change naturally. Two examples, one from fluids, say water, another one from solids, say rubber, these materials almost do not change their volume no matter how you try to deform them. Now, therefore, for such objects, the motion is isochoric from the outset, and this entails, endows these objects with, a, in some sense, some special property. And in that case, we call the motion incompressible. Okay. Right, so we're essentially done. So the goal was to analyze the um, map between material line, surface, and volume elements. And we're essentially uh, done with that goal. Just waiting for everyone to complete writing. Okay, so at this stage we have to learn two of these. The aerial map, yes, eventually it's useful and it is used, um, we have to know it, but when we do carry on with the developments, two of the maps will appear again and again. The first one is the map for line elements, and the second one is the map for volume elements. Okay. Um, now, not only will these maps appear again and again, the deformation gradient tensor is going to appear all over the place. Okay. 
And because it's a two-point tensor, and now this is going to be a long remark, a long remark that is actually uh, prone to being arbitrarily long, uh, but I'm going to cut it to a portion that is suitable for the goals of this course and make it very compact. Uh, so the deformation gradient tensor, not only will it appear many times, but it's going to appear um, as a tensor that it, a tensor, as a tensor, it will appear with many other quantities. So we have to be careful that we manipulate it correctly so that it always appears next to objects it is supposed to appear next to. So what do I mean by that? In other words, there are, so if you make a mistake, it can end up in a wrong location. And then actually, um, because it shouldn't be there, the results are in some sense meaningless. Or put in other words, if you're careful with what we're doing, what you are doing, and if you make a mistake, nevertheless, just because you can analyze which objects are appearing to one another, you can say, oh, this shouldn't happen. I must have done a mistake somewhere, and you can go back and correct it. So let me give you an example. Um, so remark. Um, so I will take two vectors, right? One of them is a Eulerian vector, and the other one is a Lagran Lagrangian vector. And what I'd like to do is simply operate on these. Now, when I have f operating on a vector that lives in R0, this is meaningful because that's the job of f. The job of f is to take a vector from R0 and map it to R. And v does live in R0. Now, I understand that conceptually. Let's see how the math is somehow in line with that argument. And the way it is in line with that argument is if I write the components of f explicitly, ei1, ea, and if I write the components of v explicitly, vb1, vb, eb, right? And I want to carry out this calculation now explicitly. I use the rules for tensor calculation. And I have fia, vb, ei multiplying, well, let's put it here, ea dot eb. Of course, by this time, you can do the calculations very fast. But nevertheless, here I write out everything explicitly. I have a dot product between two vectors. Now, I have a dot product between two vectors that belong to the same configuration, in this case, R0. So as I'm carrying out the calculations and I see something popping up like this, I say, oh, it's fine. I can do this. And I know it's delta ab. Okay. And in the end, what I gain out of this is that F multiplying V obeys the rules, usual rules for tensor vector multiplication, where the summation is over the second index, and then there is some basis attached to it. Yes, the basis is, it's now, I'm extracting only one basis, and rightly so, because this object is supposed to live on the current configuration. But if you look at the components, just usual matrix vector multiplication. Okay. Uh, now, suppose you carried out your calculations, okay, and this does happen, believe me, um, and you end up with, for instance, such an operation. So this is fine. Right? Uh, let's carry on. Now, V lives, small v lives on the current configuration. So now, in principle, that's just a tensor and that's just a vector. Fine. Okay. So you can still try to do the same thing. There appears this dot product. Now, 
mathematically, okay? Well, even mathematically, somebody could at this point, if they were able to intrude into this video, they could say, well, what you're doing is already meaningless. But say, mathematically, you can do this because I have one vector, another vector. Yes, I can take the dot product. Uh, but just notice that even if A is equal to J, these are two different sets of basis vectors. In other, in other words, E1, e, capital E1, dot, small E1, is not necessarily 1 because they are not aligned in the same way. In other words, when I end up with the, the components of a vector, those components do not obey usual matrix vector multiplication. This is something we discussed way at the beginning when we discussed the intricacies of working with non-orthonormal basis sets. It's similar to that, right? So not only will the result not obey usual rules for matrix vector multiplication, because there is going to come terms associated with this non-Kronecker delta type uh, dot product, but also now physically, again, I am trying to somehow take an operation between two quantities that live on different configurations. This lives on the current configuration, and this lives on the reference configuration. Again, mathematically, you could do this, but the message here is that whenever you do your calculations and you end up with such a operation, stop. You've done something wrong. It should not have happened, okay? Uh, because F should only operate on quantities that live on the reference configuration, okay? Um, now, I'm going to uh, give you a number of other examples that indicate a possible error. Um, so this is a cross, okay? We should not, we should not have to do that, okay? So I'm going to write here not meaningful. Not meaningful in the sense that, again, it's not going to appear when we carry out our um, theoretical developments. Now comes uh, a reference to earlier remarks. For instance, now suppose you'd like to calculate F transpose. Okay? F transpose is supposed to be FIA. So it's not FAI, EI bun EA. When you take the transpose, you have to transpose the bun. So in other words, it's going to be EA bun EI. That's the correct thing to do. Okay? So and not okay. even if AI, so even this is meaningless. Yes, eventually these will have some values like 1, 2, 1, 3, et cetera, but conceptually the first index is the index that has to do with the spatial, and the second one is the index supposed to do with the reference configuration. So you cannot switch them. And why do we necessarily have to do it with, in this fashion by referring to this type of an argument? Well, let me write or recall with you the definition of what a transpose is. The transpose is such that if you have such a relation, then you take it to the other side as a transpose. Okay. Now, F operates on a vector. What type of a vector? Necessarily referential. What ends up is a spatial one. So if I'm going to dot it with something else, better be spatial as well. So this is an expression that makes sense. Now, I'm supposed to take it to the other side. It's a transpose. Now, when I take the transpose, now this thing should be able to operate on a spatial vector. For that to be possible, the second vector of the basis has to live on the spatial configuration because this is going to operate with the basis vectors of this vector, right? So then what ends up is a referential vector and that is dotted with a referential vector, right? So that is equal to F I A E A bun E I dotted with V B E B sorry yep. operating on sorry let's correct that V J E J operating on V B E B so E I dot E J is what's going to come here. That it has to be that way. And for that to be possible, the transpose have, has to have the right ordering of the basis, and it does, whereas this one is meaningless. If I were to plug that in there, I would have to take the dot of that with 
this, and that would not be meaningful. Right? So that's the transpose of f. Let's move on, make another remark regarding um, f inverse. Okay, so I'd like to calculate f inverse, and that is, I'm going to do it indirectly like this. So now I know that identity should be equal to delta ij ei bond ej. I'm sorry, okay, I'll wait for a second. I'll pull up this board. So I like to calculate f inverse, an expression for f inverse. And I have the definition for f, small x over capital X. That's delta ij ei ej. I'm going to write delta ij as del xi over del xj. All right. Um, and so that is, if you like, partial derivative of a vector with respect to itself, as we've discussed before. And now I can do a partial here, actually, chain rule. And I can write partial x over x itself as such. Okay, And that's equal to identity. That is f. And therefore, this must be f inverse. Or if you like, you could have started with capital X over X, and uh, that would be a F inverse times F. Okay, So that is the expression for F inverse. And F inverse, now have a look. F inverse is now going to have um, components del capital XA over XI. But not only that, you recognize that the capital X is at the top. And therefore, the first basis vector in the tensorial basis has to do with the referential one. So the basis is also switched. Okay. And that is equal to the components of F inverse. The components of, and the components are AI or of F inverse. Again, this is just my notation that I've introduced before. I've done the same thing for transpose the components ai of f inverse. So this is not 1 over f i a or something. It's just in um, So I'm trying to calculate um, f inverse. And it has that expression, as I've just explained. And so that's f inverse ai capital ea bond um, small ai. All right. And you can do a check of that expression, whether it makes sense or not. And the way I'm going to do that is, instead of calculating f, f inverse, and that's an identity tensor that lives, if you like, on the spatial configuration, I'm going to calculate f inverse f. So f inverse f. Now, let's see if this result is meaningful. So it's equal to del xa over xi ea bond ei multiplying f. So xj over xb, ej bond eb. Okay. And so that's equal to del xa, del xi, del xj, del xb. And the rule right, that we have derived when a tensor product like this appears um, is that I take the dot of these two vectors, ei dot ej, and bond the outer ones, ea bond eb. And this is now delta ij. And I can take that delta ij, cancel it, make this an i, 
And now this is del xi, 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 xb, and now therefore this becomes nothing but del xa over del xb. And that is also a Kronecker delta, delta ab. And therefore, this tensor is indeed also an identity. But the difference from the identity that we saw there is that it lives, if you like, on the reference configuration and not on the current one. Okay. So now, having said all of this, for instance, how do you calculate the components of the tensor at inverse? Well, you do it in the way you normally do it. So in other words, you take the components of, of FIA and you invert it. And that will give you the components AI of the inverse. Okay, so numerically, you still just invert it in a straightforward fashion. Right? Okay, in particular, so because um, um, or likewise for the transpose, you really don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry so much about the fact that perhaps. E1 is not the same as capital E1. In practice, so for instance, when you do a numerical solution, often you do choose them to be the same. What you really you should be worrying about is that when quantities operate on each other, these are for you a guide to make sure that you are doing things in the correct way. So for instance, here, when I try to do this calculation, correct quantities appear to one another. And if they don't, then I realize or recognize that I must have made a mistake there. So it's a guide for me more than a uh, numerical correctness or incorrectness. It's just a guide. Okay. All right, so questions here? OK, then I'll see you next time.